my name is Amir. I'm the head of developer experience at Cypress. And what that really means to you, you know, what the job of the developer experience team at Cypress is, is to kind of figure out uh, new methodologies, patterns that could be in form of plugins or other ways to educate the industry on how to best test web applications. Um, so that's, that's kind of my focus now. And so if you all have any questions or anything like that, these are, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. So uh, one other thing before we jump into it, I like to kind of try some, something new, but I think UConf uh, Toronto has been doing a good job of this already in a way. Um, but, you know, testing is one of those topics that uh, triggers a lot of questions about a lot of different things. And so I would like to keep the conversation going after the, after the talk. So if you find a slide that you, that you see is interesting or if you have a question regarding it, take a snapshot, tweet it out, and I will definitely follow up with you on that tweet. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So uh, before we talk about, you know, view along with Cypress and how you can do all that, um, you know, I want to just talk about testing. And obviously, this is a super hot topic, right? Everybody loves to talk about testing. But uh, I know it's not. But, uh, but that's the thing we're trying to change at Cypress. We're trying to actually make testing cool, fun, and actually enjoyable. And, but I'm not here to tell you, you know, to eat your broccoli. I'm not here to tell you that you should test and all that good stuff. Everybody, I think, kind of now knows that, you know, testing is one of those things we should all be doing. It's important, and uh, we should all be doing more of it. Um, so I'm not here to talk to you in that manner. I'm here to advocate for you to kind of change your perspective of where testing fits within the development life cycle, right? Because usually testing is an afterthought, right? You sometimes find yourself entering projects that you that don't have tests at all, that they were never written, or you find yourself working on a project that you have to really finish up, and then after the fact, you try to kind of add some tests after you're done. Uh, so testing doesn't get a whole lot of love, and this is especially important for end-to-end uh, -end tests that need more love than any other type of test. Um, you know, people kind of just tack it on at the, at the end. So this is the point where I kind of refer to the, the testing pyramid, right? You've probably seen this abstraction uh, with regards to all the different types of tests we write. End-to-end uh, -end testing is all the way up, up top because those types of tests are notoriously uh, difficult to write, implement, execute, all that good stuff. So, yeah, you know, it doesn't get a whole lot of love, and a lot of developers love to write unit tests, right? They're very small, they're concise, they get to the point, and we love to write a lot of those. So keep that in mind. Um, but there's this shift, and it's actually, there's an actual term for it. I, when I first heard of it, I thought it was kind of a marketing term, but it's an actual trend within the industry. And this is referring to the shift of testing or uh, looking at quality uh, checks and assurance uh, to be done more closer to the point of development. Um, so pretty much kind of moving away from purely having just QA teams uh, purely test things after the fact, and then development teams just developing. It's moving that testing process into the development uh, point. Um, and this also could mean that QA teams better integrate with uh, development teams to kind of, uh, you know, orchestrate that and help out with that. But, and you know, this is a great direction, this whole shift left mentality, but this is not what I'm referring to. And the reason for that is because even with this model, uh, Testing is a separate thing from development. It happens at a different point in time. Uh, regardless of how sooner or later you do it, it, it's a completely different thing. And, you know, the thing I'm trying to present here today and to kind of show how Cypress enables is how testing can actually accelerate iteration during the implementation stage. So testing isn't something that you would kind of just do to validate that everything works after you've built it. It's something you actually do to help you build the thing you're trying to build. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about test-driven development. That's not what I'm referring to. You know, with test-driven development, as we kind of learned yesterday, is you need all the specifications up front. They need to be as clear as possible. You have to really not have things be vague. And you need to know all the inputs so you can know all the outputs so you can make all the right assertions as you are iterating. Um, but again, that is not what I'm referring to. I'm purely referring to the fact of utilizing tests as a method, as a way to help you Better, uh, better iterate and implement the thing you are trying to build. So, you know, the thing is, is developers, um, especially ones that are come to conferences and are keen on trying new technology, um, you know, we love to experiment. We, we are kind of faced with new libraries, modules, patterns, all sorts of things all the time. And when we set out to build new things, the project specifications are often 
not very clear. They kind of give you a general direction, but it's not super solidified. You don't always have that luxury. So we find ourselves, you know, in a place of experimentation where we're trying out this new thing that we just saw, and ho hopefully I think I understood how it works. Maybe I have to go read the docs. And we have this kind of, you know, process of experimentation where we're doing something, poking it, making sure it works, and then kind of moving along. But we don't really know how the final thing will always uh, look like. We kind of have to play with it till we, till we get there. And so we need to be able to kind of freely experiment um, as we're trying to develop uh, the thing we're trying to develop. So, um, you know, the best way I can kind of uh, describe this, uh, this way of working is to kind of refer to some real engineering examples I have from, from my own experiences. Um, I think this will help like kind of solidify um, my, my perspective here. So uh, I've had a chance to work on some pretty, pretty cool projects throughout my career. And one, I'll refer to two. Um, one that is particularly relevant uh, to this is um, working on the engine controller vibration mitigation system for the SpaceX Falcon rocket. So when there's a rocket launch, you know, it's quite the explosive, uh, you know, affair. And what that happens, there's a lot of vibration and shock going through the system at that point in time. So if you have a, this uh, circuitry, which is the engine controller, you know, it's just the just the, you know, it's almost like a piece of plastic. That thing is gonna get vibrated like crazy. It's gonna shake a lot, it's gonna vibrate a lot, it could stop working. Now in the aerospace industry, there's a lot of redundancy to kind of mitigate some of this, but these engine controller systems are actually mounted so closely to the engine itself, because if it's mounted farther away, you need extra harnesses and so on. So we need a way to mitigate vibration um, on these systems. So what do we do? Well we have this thing called a vibration test system. This is kind of like how one looks like. And what you can do is uh, mount things to it, and this, you know, to shake a lot to see how, how it behaves. And it's, uh, you know, so we mount that engine controller onto a, a, a vibration test bed like this, and we, we instrument it with different sensors like accelerometers. So we shake it in a certain way, in a certain condition, and then we check to see what the response uh, and what the behavior of the material um, was. So this is kind of like when you uh, mount a DOM into uh, mount a component or, or an um, element onto the DOM, right? And then you got dev tools and things like that to you know, check to see what, what's going on. It's, it's the same concept. Um, another example uh, here is, and actually the thing I should mention about this, which is, which is key, which is that you know, when I was first assigned this project to kind of mitigate vibrations on the system, is I didn't know how I was going to do that. I had no idea. I had to go out and experiment. Um, I didn't know all the effects of all sorts of materials that I could be using to accomplish this. But I had to go you know, you, you know, figure out the first thing I want to use, and then use that new material, go put it, put it on the vibration test bed, uh, See how, see how it behaves. But I didn't know what my initial conditions for experimentation or testing would be, and I didn't know what the results would be. So it wasn't really test-driven development. It was kind of experimentation-based development, which is I find myself doing a lot when developing web applications. You know, when you kind of building a new UI, as you're iterating, you're, you do something, and then you go ahead and check it. Like, you type into it, you click into it, you do all sorts of things to make sure that, like, okay, I think I'm on the right track. Then you go back and you add some more code, you know, and then you come and do the thing, and you're kind of doing this manually over and over again throughout the, the development process. Another example of this is uh, working on the actuator, it, it's, a, it's a mouthful, it's called Actuator Electronic Ground Support Equipment, NASA loves their acronyms. Um, but essentially this was a, a machine that would simulate uh, different conditions for all the different actuators on the the Curiosity rover. So this rover has many motors on it, many actuators. Motors are just actuators. Um, and we need a way to experiment the, uh, you know, uh, with these motors to figure out that if, if their particular design will be uh, viable on Mars. So this is kind of what that ground uh, support equipment looks like. It's a, you know, it's a kind of like a server rack kind of setup. And what you would do is, you know, we would build these things and we would ship them out to teams all across the world that were working on the various systems of the rover. And they would utilize this to, you know, see, uh, okay, if I simulate this condition, which, you know, it could be this many degrees on Mars, can this and motor handle it? So it would simulate all these various conditions and then it, they would check to see if the current design and implementation would be viable. Um, so again, kind of like the, the same as the web application development, you're doing some, doing some things, and then you go, go ahead and play, play with the thing you just built to kind of see if it's a viable way forward for the next iteration on it. 
So all these things kind of, um, you know, were important because, you know, they allowed me to consistently and reliably simulate uh, different scenarios so I could, you know, uh, work towards the viable implementation. And we need to be able to do this more and more so as we're developing these complex, very client-side uh, heavy applications. So I wanted the same test apparatus for the web, and this is kind of what led me to uh, find and love Cypress. So, you know, if you don't already know, Cypress is simply a tool that allows you to quickly and reliably test anything that runs in your browser, and best of all, it's free, open source, under the MIT license. And the goal of it is to test you help anything in the browser. Um, and the reason why it was really built in the first place was that, you know, as the web developed in the better part of the last two decades, um, you know, the tools that existed for doing browser-based tests, they were kind of started in the early 2000s, and the way we developed applications back then is very different than the way we develop them now, right? Now we have these really fancy frameworks and we develop these really rich applications for users. Um, before it was just server-side stuff shipped down, shipped down to the user, but now we have to manage a lot of state in the front end, right? There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of network requests. There's a lot of things that have to be managed. So the web went from being stateless to stateful, and we needed a better tool that was designed to work with these types of new applications, to test them. So how can you go about you know, using Cypress to do this type of testing? Well, you simply just npm install Cypress. You don't have to do anything else. And once you do this, you get everything you need, an all-in-one tool to get up and running with testing your web, web applications. And it uses kind of familiar tools underneath. Um, if you're familiar with Mocha, Chai, or Sign-On, like Chai is, you know, helps us do some assertions. Sign-On allows us, allows us to do some stubbing. And Mocha is kind of the underlying test framework. Um, so these are all familiar uh, things underneath. And, but, you know, because Vue is so awesome and also Vue CLI is so awesome, it actually includes Cypress as an end-to-end -end testing option when you're bootstrapping a new project. So the next time you're bootstrapping a new project with the Vue CLI, check the end-to-end -end testing option and you'll be given Cypress as, uh, as a thing to set up um, along with your project. So make sure you kind of watch out for that one. So after you bring up Cypress for the first time, it's going to look something like this. Now, if it's a clean, brand new project, it's going to include uh, you know, it, you don't have any tests so far, so Cypress is going to say, hey, let me put some example tests there, and these are just a suite of uh, tests that go through all the various uh, actions that Cypress provides. And it also scaffolds the project directory, or the, the folder directory structure um, that you need to kind of uh, organize all the supporting files for your test. But anyways, eventually you'll get here, right? This is, this is Cypress uh, when you first open it up, and it's going to show you all the test specification files you have within your project. And to run any of these test spec files, well, you just have to click on it. So let's click on the first one, which is action spec JS. And Cypress is going to bring up a real browser, in this case, Chrome, and it's going to pull in your application, and it's going to immediately start executing all the tests within that test spec file that we just clicked on. So the experience looks something like this, and we call this the test runner. So this is the, how that experience looks like. Now, before we get to the rest of the, you know, how yeah, the rest of the experience with Cypress, one thing I should mention is that you know Cypress, you know, the thing that differentiate, differentiates it is not just the core tech underneath, but also how it leverages that core tech via a really nice developer experience, and this is a, a top priority for us. So let's look at how that test runner is kind of, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, what it's made of. So on the right-hand side, we have your application, right? We pull that in with an, via an iframe, and it's a real app. You can interact with it as you like. It's the full thing. On the left-hand side, it's the command log. Uh, the command log shows all the test suites, all the tests within those suites, and every single thing, action, whatever it may be that, may be that took place uh, during the time of that testing. So you'll see um, you know, all the assertions that took place, you see all the network requests that took place, you'll see um, yeah, you know, any other you know, UI manipulation that took place as well. It's all right there for you to see in the exact order that they were ex executed, which is very important. 
other thing Cypress provides is very human readable error messages. You know, half half the goal of or the you know the the point of any test framework is to be able to tell you what went wrong, you know, and when it went wrong. And so with Cypress, we try to do a really good job with this. So we have uh, human readable error messages. A lot of these we actually wrote by hand, um, so they're actually readable uh, to folks. And we're trying to do a much better job with this uh, moving forward. I'll talk about that a little later. But the other cool thing is, since this whole experience is, is you know, running within the browser, well, you get access to DevTools. Um, so now you have the ability to debug your test code and your application code at the same time. And you know, they do overlap a lot with each other, so it's kind of good to having all that in the same view. And Cypress kind of helps you out with this um, via, if you click any of the actions that took place, uh, for example, I click on this uh, post request um, uh, that kind of went wrong here, it re responded with the 400. If I click on that, Cypress will dump all the helpful information it knows regarding that network request into the DevTools console, for a lot, you know, making it a lot more convenient for you to inspect what went wrong. Yeah, now here's one of my favorite features uh, uh, of this test run review. So Cypress takes a DOM snapshot after every single action it takes. This allows you to essentially time travel through all the state changes of your app um, by simply clicking on the action at that point in time that took place, or just simply scrubbing your mouse across all the actions that took place in a given test, and you get to see how your app changed with every little thing that, that took place, which is super awesome. It's fun to watch, but it also helps you a lot um, with, uh, with debugging. Cool, so now let's check out the Cypress API. The Cypress API, um, People love it because it's very intuitive and it's almost English-like. So how do you use it? Well, we provide you this CY global and all the commands you can access come from this global right here. So for example, if I want to get a button, I just use the get command and I pass in the button selector to get that button element from the page. Now, once I have this button, I can you know, manipulate it so I can click on it and then I can make assertions against it. So I can say, this button should have a class active. Or I can do somewhat more complex things. For example, I can use the request command to make a request to an endpoint, then grab its body, then make an assertion against that network body. Um, the key thing to point out here with, uh, with, Cy with the Cypress API is that um, it's a chaining-based API. So when I did button, now the subject of the chain becomes that button element. And this button element is going to pass through the chain and all the various commands can do other things against that, uh, against that subject. So keep, keep that in mind. Cypress has a chaining-based API. Um, the other important thing to note about Cypress is that it's, when you compose Cypress tests, they don't get, the, the test commands don't imperatively, imperatively get executed. It's almost like a declarative way of uh, declaring your tests. Um, so for example, we have these four uh, lines of Cypress code. Uh, you know, that's pretty simple. I'm just kind of filling out, uh, uh, you know, email input box. So I'm grabbing the name input, I'm typing my name in, then I'm grabbing the email input, typing my email in, then I'm submitting the form, then I'm making sure a success message on the page is visible. Now, Cypress will look at this code and then it will essentially create a deterministic queue of actions to take. And Cypress will execute them in the exact order I've declared them. So that, you know, it's what you see is what you get. And the thing is, the web is a very asynchronous place. Things could happen at any given time. So Cypress doesn't care about that. Uh, Cypress is aware of it. But when you're writing your tests like this, Cypress will execute them in the exact order that you've declared them. Cool. So before we can talk about some of the other things that Cypress provides, it's good to know how, uh, you know, uh, how Cypress kind of works and its architecture. So Cypress fully runs, uh, at least the test runner experience you're seeing, within the browser. So your test code is actually living within the browser. That means that it's running within the same execution run loop as your application. So it, they live in the same exact world, and this allows Cypress to know exactly what's going on at, at any given point in time, right? It lives in the same world. It's not like other frameworks where the test code is executing outside of the browser context, and, and the test code can only query the browser to see what's going on. The way I like to describe this is, you know, we're all in this room, and you know we're all together, and we can all speak speak with each other. We can look each other in the eye. I can see this guy is going to go out this way, and things like that, right? But um, 
Imagine if somebody was outside of this room and all they can do is knock on the door and ask us, hey, what's going on in there? Who's talking in there? What are they talking about? And that's the only way they can uh, know what's going on uh, inside this room. And hopefully someone will walk to the door and actually tell them, yeah, something's going on, but they wouldn't actually open the door. They would just kind of whisper across the door. Um, so that's how, that's how you know, traditional frameworks would work. But Cypress lives within the browser, lives right alongside your application. Now, Cypress does have a node backend that it communicates with. Um, and this node backend is used to kind of provision the bringing up of browsers for testing, but it also allows you to, to, um, to take uh, actions at the system level. So for example, what if you want to provision uh, a database uh, for testing? What if you want to seed a database for testing? What if you want to clear a database for testing? What if you want to do anything else to prepare the world for your test? And you sometimes need to do that stuff on the system level. You need to make requests to a database or something like that or maybe a queuing system, or maybe S3, whatever. You can still do all that with Cypress very easily. Cool. But the number one perk of being able to run within the browser context is the fact that, you know, your tests are going to be much faster. You get the full power of the V8 engine, and your tests are going to run just as fast as your application can, can execute. Cool. So now we can talk about some of the other things that uh, Cypress, um, the Cypress architecture enables. There's this concept of automatic waiting. So, you know, maybe in the past with other frameworks, you've kind of had to include, you know, uh, artificial, uh, you know, timeouts or pauses or something like that for something to come to life within the browser so you can move forward with your tests. But with Cypress, you really don't need to do that. Cypress automatically waits uh, for things to become, you know, come to life, to exist, and for them to also become actionable. So, for example, if you look at our earlier, uh, you know, demo, we got this button, and then we wanted to click this button. But Cypress will not actually click that button until that button is actionable. So if it's disabled or something else, or maybe if it's not visible to the user, Cypress will not take action. And then we want to make this assertion, well, Cypress will wait till this uh, button has this class before you know, it, uh, it moves on. Now, Cypress won't wait forever. It'll wait by default up to four seconds, and then it will move forward, and this is configurable. But the cool thing here is that Cypress does the waiting for you, and since Cypress you know, knows everything that is going on within the browser, it will react immediately to, 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 to something uh, coming to life or being actionable. It can, it can do all this stuff, figure it out really fast, and move on with the rest of the test. Cool. So how should you go about approaching tests, right? Testing your app. Well. There are these kind of three layers of any web application components, so on and so forth. Well, we have the interface layer, right? That's the thing we interact with. That's the thing we all kind of love developing. Um, we have that. And then we also have the logic and the state. This, these could be two different layers, but you know, this is kind of like maybe your view Xcode or other internal logic of your component. And then we have the network layer, right? This is all the requests we're making in and out um, that are coming you know, in and out of our application. So we can test all these different layers. Um, we don't have to always test each one, depending on what our goal is. Um, but Cypress gives us the ability to test each of these layers. So let's kind of go ahead and see how we can do some of that. Cool. So, but one thing I was I always like to mention is that you always want to test uh, your apps from the user's perspective. Don't get bogged down on testing implementation. That stuff can change day by day designer by designer, whatever, right? Just test what the actual experience of the user is supposed to be. And this is the true benefit of end-to-end -end tests, right? They're supposed to sim simulate the, the user's real actions, and that's why they're running in a real browser. So just start off at least with focusing on the, the critical paths of your applications and the, and the things that your users need to get done for your app to be considered a success for them. Cool. So if you look at these layers again, well, with the... With the interface layer, we can interact with it and see you know, how it changes. Um, and then we can make assertions against those changes. Uh, we can even do some things like uh, visual regression testing on the interface, just to kind of get that layer of validation. Um, when it comes to the internal logic and state layer, um, well, because Cypress runs within the browser, well, it has this very unique privilege. It can access your application's code and your application's internal state. So you can actually call in to your code and uh, see what the current state of affairs are. And, you can, this, and we'll kind of see an example of this, but we can also kind of see uh, how we can insert, inject state within your application 
uh, or utilize the pre-existing code you already have to take, um, you know, to manipulate the app further. So we can we have access to that layer as well. And on the network layer, we can spy on the network requests going in and out, or we can stub or mock uh, those uh, network requests that are taking place as well. So let's uh, take a look at the network layer uh, first. Well. Uh, doing network uh, stubbing and spying is super easy, and this is like one of those things I was like, wow, the first time I saw it. So if you want to, let's say, you know, let's say we have a to-dos application, and when our to-dos application comes up for the first time, it's going to make a request to the back end, a get request uh, to the to-dos endpoint, and it's going to grab all the to-dos that our application has in it. So the way we can spy on that get request is first we can utilize uh, the CY uh, or the server command. So we do CY.server. This sets up a, kind of like a stubbing server or a spying server that all the network requests pass through for Cypress to keep track of. Once we do that, we just have to tell Cypress which network requests we care about. So we can use the, the route command to say, okay, so any get request that goes to the to-do's endpoint, I want to keep track of. And let's give it a name. Let's label this as to-dos. That's kind of our way of aliasing or labeling network requests that are coming in and out. So once we do this, we've set up our network stubbing and spy, or spying in this case, then we can go ahead and visit our page. Then we visit the page, the page loads, and then we can, do, we can use the wait command and refer to that network request via its alias, and this is the string pattern we use, this at uh, prefix, uh, at symbol prefix on the alias uh, that we saw earlier. So we say, hey, wait on the to-dos request to come back whenever it comes back. Whenever it does that, then we can go ahead and do other things. So for example, we'll grab the body of the response and make some other assertions against it, and after we do that, we can go on and make some other assertions against uh, the UI as well. So, but as you can see, just to do the setting up the spying is like two lines of code. And we can do the same thing, uh, uh, but for stubbing. So, you know, we don't want to make a real request to our backend. We kind of want to, you know, maybe use a fixture, a data fixture, right? Um, and Cypress, uh, you know, that initial project directory creates, it actually gives you a fixtures folder for you to put in sample data that you want to use. So you can dump in anything you want in there, like a JSON file, a CSV file, an image, whatever it may be that could be a responsive request. And you can easily refer to all that data within that fixtures directory via this uh, fixture prefix, so I say fixture colon sample to do's, which is just a JSON file within my, my project. So when I do this, I'm just going to get back that sample JSON as the response of this get request, and that's how I can stub that network request. Cool. And again, going back to the network, uh, <laughs> the developer experience of this, is that now that you have set up spying or stubbing, Cypress will identify that you've done that within the command log. So over here, it's, you know, it has this little routes table. It's saying, okay, so I'm watching the get request, the to-dos endpoint, and yes, it is stubbed, and also it has an alias called to-dos. And the last number, the little counter uh, pound symbol thing there, that's telling you how many times that network request was made. And I find this to be really helpful because a lot of the times, uh, you know, maybe I'm jumping into a new application that I don't know much about. It's really nice to see uh, you know, every time a network uh, call is made, so I can kind of understand the behavior of the app. It, it's nice seeing like, okay, maybe this network request is being made too many times, I should kind of tone it down or something like that. Um, and the aliasing, I like how it's labeled because then I can kind of follow that network request throughout my tests, right? I can just follow that yellow label, I can know where it popped up, uh, you know, within the life cycle of the test. So this is really awesome. Cool. So let's talk about how we can uh, tap into the internal state of review app um, to help us write some tests against it. Well, um, as I said, Cypress runs alongside your application. So how can Cypress get access to your app? Well, you know, in your you know index.js or app.js, you know, wherever you put your uh, your top root directory um, uh, view instance, uh, you can essentially assign uh, that that view instance to any variable you like within the window global of the DOM. So, and you can do this conditionally, so you can use window.cypress because if Cypress is running, it will assign the Cypress global to, to, the, to the window. And you can check Cypress is running like this and then assign your view app instance to any variable you like. So in this case, I'm just doing underscore underscore app um, as, the, as the, my, my testing variable. Cool. And then once I do this, 
I get access to my entire application, and I can do all sorts of things with it. For example, um, you know, logging in is a very common thing that you have to do over and over again in, a, in, a, in tests, right? And then you know, your colleagues are also writing tests. They also have to log in and things like that. Um, so it happens over and over again. Now, when we have a login window, there's usually like an email input box or a password, and we have a, you know, a login button. And we can drive that UI every single time we want to log in, and we should have a test for that to validate the UI layer. But it's not efficient to do that every single time we want to log in someone to do some test, right? We can be a little more efficient because we have access to our application's code. So for other tests, we can just programmatically log in the user. So for example, in this app, I have a login uh, action within my Vuex store, right? And I can just tap in into that action like this um, by using that, uh, that, the app instance that was assigned to the window, and then just call that action. You can just do that. So you can programmatically log in very easily to with, via whatever logic you have in your, uh, in your view application. And this is really awesome because you know, not only is it more efficient, because every time you have to drive the UI, you've got to type in things and you've got to click, and all that takes time. It all has to trigger browser events. Um, but when you do it programmatically, um, you know, you're also using your application's code. This is code you've already written, you've already made investments into it, and now you're able to reuse that code to help you compose your test, and it's going to give you a much higher level of confidence um, within, your, within the functionality of your application. So this is really cool, and the way you can access that window object is, you guessed it, you just use the window command of Cypress. It will give you the window, and you can do whatever you want uh, with it. And you can also do other things. For example, uh, you know, provisioning the state of an app is a common thing you have to do during testing, right? Um, it's like, if I'm testing a to-dos app, what if I want a thousand to-do items in it so I can do some sort of test with it? Well, I can just inject the state I want by accessing the mutation uh, within the Vuex store of, of the app, or, what, which, or whichever other way my app is built. It doesn't matter. Um, but I, can, I have direct access into the internal state of my application, and I can provision the state I need to do the test I need to do. So that's pretty cool. And then, um, uh, and then you know, we can also just access the state to also make assertions against the internal state. So in this case, you know, I've waited for a network request to come back, the to, that to-dos request, and then after that, I'm making assertions within to the internal state of my application. So you don't always need to do it within the UI layer, depending on what you're doing. So there's a lot of versatility here on which layer of the app or component you can test. Cool. Now, this is experimental. So if you guys are interested in this, please let me know, because I will dedicate my life into solving this problem. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think component testing, there's a lot of good going on right now, but I think we can do a much better job uh, uh, with it. And I think there's a lot of value to being able to do isolated component tests in a real browser, you know, exhibiting real browser events and, and user actions. So we currently have this very experimental uh, uh, plugin, you could say, um, called Cypress View Unit Test, and it gives you this mount function. And you can essentially pass in your view component into this mount function, and it will take it in, it will run whatever preprocessor you have, Webpack, whatever it may be, to build the component, and then it will take that component and mount it in isolation into the DOM of the browser, and then you can move on with your merry day writing Cypress tests like this. So all you really have to do is just run mount my component before it, each test starts, and that's it. So I think this is going on, going towards a cool direction, and if you're all interested in it, um, please let me know on Twitter, and I would like to discuss it further with you. Cool. So there's also visual testing you can do, and I won't dive too much into that, because that's a whole world of its own, um, maybe at a different time. Uh, but uh, you know, there are open source plugins that enable uh, visual testing, but if you really are going to rely on visual testing and to do it right, I think you really need some of these services that are being built out today or, and exist. Uh, two of the really good ones are Apply Tools and Percy, and they've actually already integrated with Cypress. They have Cypress uh, plugins, uh, so they provide Cypress commands you can use within your tests. And uh, you know, I, if you're going to go down the route of visual testing, I highly suggest you check out these, uh, these other options. And also within our Cypress docs, we have a whole section on visual testing. And we have that little link down at the below. And of course, these slides will be shared uh, later. So just, just something to keep in mind. Um, also, uh, recently, there was a talk at ReactiveConf uh, from one of our friends at Apple Tools. And he did a really good job um, 
of kind of you know laying out all the challenges with visual testing and you know and all the different ways you can go about solving those uh, those problematic challenges. So um, this will also be up. I highly suggest you check this out if you um, uh, if you have problem with, uh, or if you want to go down the route of visual testing. And, you know, one of the problems with visual testing that, it's not a problem, but it's just a challenge with it, is that, you know, things can render differently, even images, not just like you, uh, CSS elements, between different browser versions, uh, it, just, it just does. Um, also, you also have to take into consideration responsiveness. So, do I want to test, visually test my app for mobile, desktop, tablet, whatever, and it's like, that, that, that's a lot of permutations that have to take place, and that's a lot of image snapshots you have to manage. So you gotta take all these things into consideration. So I suggest taking out, checking out this talk. Cool, so let's move on forward. Um, so how do you know when you're done writing your test, right? That's the, that's the good moment, you're like, hey, I'm done. Um, so there is no right way, there's no clear answer. But I, th I think there are ways to solve this, but right now, here are the solutions. Um, so one is code coverage. Um, you know, code coverage isn't some silver bullet that's going to solve all your problems, but it's a nice guide that can kind of nudge you towards the right direction. So if you're facing an app that doesn't have a, any tests really, or if it's lacking in tests, you can actually get a lot of code coverage uh, with a few uh, unit tests, especially the uni uh, not unit tests, end-to-end -end tests. Uh, especially the ones uh, towards your critical paths of your application, the money maker paths of your application. Now, once you do this, you can kind of assess the code coverage you have, and then whichever lines of code that are not covered, you can kind of check out and see, well, does this line even matter? Or maybe this line is not even accessible via my UI, but it might be accessible in some other weird way. Um, so you kind of have to assess that. You have to know if I should write maybe a few unit tests to cover these lines that are never accessed, uh, accessed by the user, um, or maybe I need to refactor my code. So code coverage can be used to kind of guide you uh, towards the right direction. Now, uh, my colleague and I, uh, Gleb Bomatov, we did like a whole hour long thing on code coverage, um, especially with using Cypress uh, to do that. And we've also created a, a code coverage plugin for Cypress that simplifies this a lot, like you just drop it in and you're done. Um, so we have a whole code coverage section within our docs, which I've linked out here, and I suggest you checking that out if you wanna uh, add code coverage to your um, tests. Also, if you have a node backend by any chance, uh, you get some additional perks. Cool, so everything we kinda saw so far, like the, the Cypress GUI coming online, that, that's all with the, via the Cypress open mode, right? It's very visual, you run it and all that stuff. It's part of your development day-to-day uh, -day workflow. You have your editor on one hand and Cypress on one side, and you're, test, you're changing your test code, and you're seeing your, uh, you know, your, your app change and your test rerunning live. So it's a really nice development workflow, and if you're into TDD, it's super good for that. But tests must run in CI, right? That's, that's, that's kind of where they go to die or, or live on forever. Um, so the way you do that is the only other command Cypress provides beyond, beyond the open command, which is the Cypress run command. This is what you do to run Cypress headlessly. Um, and this is a more efficient way of running all your tests. Sometimes I see people trying to run every single test they have via the open mode, GUI mode we have, and they run out of memory. Don't do that. Uh, just use the headless mode. Cool, so how does it look like uh, when you're running? So here's, a, here's one, here's a little video of Cypress running uh, headlessly. And it looks kind of like what you would expect um, from you know, a framework running tests headlessly. You see all your, the tests that have passed and succeeded, but the cool part with this is that Cypress will generate an entire video recording of your entire test run and give that to you as an MP4 file. And you can do whatever you want with this. Uh, share with your colleagues, whatever you like, and if you're running it in CI, you can save this as a static asset for re reference later on. Um, so this is really cool. And one other thing that you get just out of the box is if there is a failure, Cypress will take an automatic screenshot at that point in time, and you have those images uh, uh, for your viewing pleasure to help you debug further. So these are other two big wins you just get out, out of the box, which is really nice and helpful for debugging. So. Uh, one other thing I'll say, which uh, I always have to say because it's one of the things I, I built out when I first uh, got to Cypress, but it's also one of the most helpful things I think we have built um, for the industry so far when it comes to um, Cypress tests. 
Uh, so we have the Cypress dashboard, and I won't get into that, but I just want to point out this parallelization feature it has. So when you're running test in CI, you're using the run command, and if you pass in the record flag, you're also reporting your test results into the Cypress dashboard. Um, but, you know, what if you have a really big test suite and you got a lot of tests to run? Uh, how can you speed it up? Well, parallelization is one method, and the way you set up parallelization in Cypress for the most part, for most people that don't have like Snowflake CI environments, um, then all you have to do is pass in the parallel flag. That's it. That's all you got to do. You do this on all the machines that run uh, in CI, and Cypress will figure out the, the rest. So kind of let's just kind of see how this works and what the benefits are for you. Let's say you have uh, three CI machines in your uh, CI provider. Uh, these three machines come online probably very close around, you know, around the same time, right? The first machine is going to come online, and it's going to contact Cypress, and it says, hey, I'm, I got this project. I'm ready for work. And here are all the spec files I have to run. Cypress says, OK, cool. Um, since you're the first machine that came online, I think you should start on this particular spec file. And then after that, uh, the next machine will come online, and then we'll say, OK, number two, you're going to work on this spec file, and so on and so forth. But how does Cypress know which spec file to distribute first, second, and third. Well, this is the way we do it. Because you are reporting your test results to the dashboard, you're getting all, we are getting all this performance data about your, each test that you have. So we're building up kind of like a performing, performance characteristic uh, uh, of, of your test. Like, we know how your tests uh, behave. And with that information, we can forecast the future duration of your test run running some algorithms. And with this forecasting, we know which tests, test file to run first, second, and third. And this allows us to really optimize uh, test runs in CI. And we do this calculation on the fly every single time you run your build for every single spec file. And the real implications of that you know, is, is, is big. So this is like a really small project. And when we turn on parallelization for it, adding four machines, it brought it down from two minutes to 30 seconds. And you're like, oh, wow, good job. You know, like only barely anything. But if you apply it to like a real application, uh, this is our own Cypress dashboard, which is like a big React project. And at the time of turning on parallelization for it, we added six machines, and the build time went from about 23 minutes to just under four minutes. So this was about 83% improvements. And now this app is much bigger, much larger. We're running way more tests, and we have way more machines. And this is allowing us to iterate much faster in CI. So with all that said, I'll kind of leave you off with some helpful information and some of the things we have uh, coming down the tube uh, so from our roadmap. So we're working on full network layer stubbing. We're kind of giving you full access to the network layer, and this is going to help with uh, you know, mocking GraphQL or handling fetch requests. We're also trying to improve error reporting a lot. We want to give you a lot more context when errors do take place. And we want you to essentially see the code frame that is being problematic within Cypress, and all you have to do is click that code frame, and we'll take you from, from Cypress to the exact point of the problem within your editor so you can fix it. So this is going to be a big uh, productivity boost. And the other thing we're going to add is test retries, which is this ability to retry a, a single test on the spot in CI, and this allows us to get rid of false negatives or potentially, uh, you know, you know, mishaps in, in CI. You know, sometimes you're running in shared environments where you don't have all the resources and things can, things can go wrong. And it, it's, not, it's not nice when that builds an entire build where all the other tests pass, but one did not. So this will be another uh, nice boost. And I, the other thing that everyone's been waiting for is cross-browser. You know, people have been waiting for this for a while, and we've been working on it. We're almost there. Um, but we have Firefox coming out very soon. Um, and so we've always said this, but Nothing ever happened. So just to kind of prove it to you. So this is a ViewConf Toronto first. Maybe we haven't seen it shown it anywhere else. <laughs> Look at this. We've got Firefox and Firefox uh, Developer Edition right there. So here we go. Here's the first public run of Firefox of Cypress ever. Here we go. There you go. Firefox. You got it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> It's a real thing. It's not a screenshot. See, it's moving. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> cool. So with that said, if you're interested in Cypress, I highly suggest you check out our docs. Um, 
It's honestly one of the things that turned me to Cypress. The docs are fantastic, and we have really big plans for it. We're going to really improve this thing. So, but if you're looking to get started, the docs is a good place to get, to get going. Um, right when you land, now you see my face, apparently. And there is a whole video we made you know, we call it Cypress in a nutshell, and this allows you, we kind of run through actually testing a whole view applications there. So ch check that out. Um, we also have a plugins page. There's plugins to do just about anything you would like. So check that out. Um, you'll find helpful utilities there, utili utilities there especially to do things like accessibility testing, visual testing, and a whole bunch of other helpful uh, utilities out there. Uh, we also have tutorial videos and the whole open source workshop we've done. So, you know, these links will be available for everyone. And with that said, you know, the thing I always like to say is that we're really trying to change the status quo of t testing. We really want to make it enjoyable and very productive for everyone, and we're only getting started. So with that said, thank you so much, and happy testing. Thank you.